People are not willing to concede that intelligent people of goodwill can be on the other side of them from an issue. It's very easy to think of a kind of faceless abstraction of conservatives or liberals, and they're all terrible people. Hey, hey, and welcome. This is the Ben Shapiro Show Sunday special. We are joined today by Ramesh Panuru. He's visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He's senior editor at National Review. He's an opinion columnist for Bloomberg. I can't wait to get started with the conversation. But first, you know, if you look at the economy right now, what you'll notice is that central banks are taking a heavy toll on the economy. Last week, China devalued its currency and markets tanked. One consequence was that Bitcoin prices rose. It's time to consider including some crypto in your portfolio. Now, I know that crypto sounds kind of scary, but what crypto really is, is it is a limited commodity, like something like gold. It's kind of like digital gold. It's protected by blockchain. They're not creating any more of it is protected from hacking. It is a resource that can't be manipulated by central governments. If you're interested in getting into looking at crypto, you should be taking a look at eToro. It is smart crypto trading. You can access the world's best cryptocurrencies. They have 15 different cryptocurrencies available, and you can try before you trade with a virtual portfolio with a $100,000 budget so you can actually try it out and see how you like it. You never miss a trading trend with charts and pricing alerts, so you're learning how to trade crypto in real time. Sign up today at etoro.com slash Shapiro. That's E-T-O-R-O dot com slash Shapiro. If you're fearful of governments manipulating currencies, if you're worried about the vacillation of the markets, maybe you should be looking at something like crypto. And the best way to do that, try it out over at etoro.com slash Shapiro. And they give you the opportunity, again, to try it out before you're even spending any of your own money. Go check them out at etoro.com slash Shapiro. That is E-T-O-R-O dot com slash Shapiro. etoro.com slash Shapiro. Ramesh, thanks so much for stopping by. You're welcome. Or it's Dinesh. Ramesh, you're telling me Anderson Cooper. It's a common confusion, actually. <laughs> yeah, Anderson Cooper is among many illustrious people who have made that mistake. <laughs> so, and I'm so much better looking, too. So it's. I mean, I've met Dinesh, and I, I must agree. Yeah. I must agree. So let's start with the spicy stuff. Your perspective on, on President Trump. So you've talked before about how you think that President Trump has affected the Republican Party and the perspectives of, of Americans going forward on politics. Do you think that he is a net benefit or net negative for conservatism and conservatives? Well, I mean, I think you'd have to say that he's accomplished a lot that conservatives want. So he got two appointees to the Supreme Court who are pretty conservative. I'd say Justice Gorsuch has been a more solid conservative and originalist than Justice Kavanaugh so far has shown himself to be. We got, a, I think, a tax reform that is on balance pretty good. Um, we've, we've seen a lot of deregulation. And uh, so I think a lot of good things have happened. Um, I think that there's a lot that is, to, to coin a, a word, deplorable <laughs> in um, the president's uh, conduct uh, and, uh, and the way he fills the role of the presidency. Um, but the thing that really strikes me about Trump is the extent to which it often seems that the goal of his presidency is to make himself the center of every conversation in America. And to a surprising degree, he succeeded in that ambition. And so what I think is a problem for conservatism, whether you're an anti-Trump conservative or a pro-Trump conservative or somewhere in between, all thought has been sort of paralyzed and everything just gets sucked into a conversation about the president's personality. I mean, that, uh, there's no question that that's true in terms of, of general politics. And, uh, my great worry about President Trump from before he was elected and certainly during his term has been maybe political, but he's been much more conservative than I thought he would be. It's really been about the poisoning of the well, particularly with young people in America. And there seems to be a certain level of sanguinity that has that has arisen among a lot of conservatives that because he bucked the odds and won right. in 2016, that Republicans are going to win from here on out, despite the fact that 2018 went very poorly for conservatives and Republicans. There's this sort of feeling that Trump is the master of a, a wing of American politics that nobody knows about, that's unpollable, that's sort of out there in the ether, and that he's going to be able to draw from that going forward and transform the country along those lines. What's your assessment of what 2016 was actually about and the durability of the Trump coalition going forward? So I think you have to separate the primaries and the general election, both of them very interesting stories. I think in the primary, you had a couple of things going on. You had 
um, the fact that the Republican Party elites had tried to foist on the party a consensus on immigration that Republican voters didn't share. And he was the most visible opponent of that. Um, so something like 7% of Republicans in a poll around that time wanted more immigration. And 15 of 16 Republican presidential candidates wanted more immigration. And Trump was the 16th, the one who said no to that and was really advertising in an unmistakable way that he would do what it takes, that he would be tough in a way that previous people had only talked about being tough on illegal immigration. So that's one part of it. Another part, he had a kind of, I think Republicans tend to prefer the executive personality. And there were a number of governors on the stage with Trump. But for various reasons, th there was a diffidence, or in Chris Christie's case, a kind of impulsiveness and glandularity, um, in Kasich's case, a sort of flakiness. Uh, and I think that Trump actually was, in a way, the most sort of traditionally executive figure on the stage. And then finally, th there was the fact that there was an existing Republican sort of formula that had been inherited from Reagan and no longer spoke to Republican primary voters. And, uh, you know, some of them actually liked Trump's heterodoxies on things like trade and entitlements. Um, some of them didn't necessarily like those things, but they weren't, uh, they weren't deal breakers for them in the way that some people thought they would, right? Club for Growth ran all these ads saying he hasn't been with us on this and he hasn't been with us on that. And it basically didn't register with people. So you add all that up and then the fact that CNN covered him like it was a missing plane <laughs> and he gets the nomination. In the general election, I think a lot of what he had going for him was his opponent. Hillary Clinton turns out to have been a really terrible candidate, um, partly because uh, conservatives had spent 30 years working with her to define her as unacceptable to a lot of Americans. And so you end up with two candidates who 60% um, of the public, you have overlapping majorities of 60% of the public think they're unsuited for the office, they're unacceptable, and the people who thought they were both unacceptable broke heavily for the challenger. Which brings us to another point, which I think gets underrated, which is it's very hard to hold on to the presidency after two terms. There was going to be a time for a change sentiment, um, regardless of who the parties nominated, and that benefited Trump. I want to go back to a point that you made about the breakdown in sort of the Reagan coalition. So there had been this conventional wisdom that the Republican Party was built around the three-legged stool, the famed three-legged stool, the social conservatives, the hawkish foreign policy acolytes, and the small government libertarians. And that you took sort of a small government view, a big defense view, and a socially conservative view, and that was going to be where the party was at. And it seems like there's been a lot of rethinking about each one of those legs of the stool. And it seems as though President Trump and his election have really uncovered a, a real can of worms because it's unclear how the coalition actually operates now. There are a lot of libertarians in the coalition who are not super socially conservative. Right. There, there are a lot of people who are who are not small government conservatives, the, the Tucker Carlson wing of the party. There are a lot of folks who are, who are now isolationist on foreign policy, the sort of Rand Paul wing of the party. How do you think that the party breaks down? Do you think that there is even a unified program for the Republican Party that isn't just the left is terrible? Right. Well, that's a, that's a big set of questions. I would say... Um, President Trump, whether it's cunning or intelligence, has a really solid understanding of what the red lines in Republican Party politics are. So there were some issues, a lot of issues, where he flipped. And when we talk about how Trump has changed the Republican Party, we shouldn't forget the Republican Party has also changed Trump and changed him quite a bit. He's not, you know, the liberal that he was on most issues back, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, he understood that he had to be pro-life. He understood, I think, that he had to be pro-gun, that he couldn't be for tax increases. Now, there are some other issues where it turns out Republican voters don't have strong attachments to the old conservative orthodoxy. Entitlements, trade, um, NATO, all of those things are in that basket of issues. Uh, and so I think he's, he's, first of all, those are the issues that, he cares about the most where he's heterodox, but he also understood that he had running room on those issues. Um, right now, hating the left is the glue of the Republican Party, but it's also true that hating the right is the glue of the Democratic Party. We have negative polarization where what holds both party coalitions together is less any policy objective or philosophical principle than enmity toward the other side. Uh, and I think that helps to account for a lot of the 
the sourness of American politics right now. And then you add in the fact that both of these coalitions basically think they're already a majority of the country. And if the other side wins anything, it's somehow illegitimate. You know, it's, you know, if people on our side, it's the deep state or it's the media. People on their side, it's, uh, it's the Koch brothers, it's dark money, it's Russian interference. And, you know, this is the, this is the um, perfect recipe for uh, the era of bad feelings that we are now living in politically. So looking back historically now, when do you think this era of bad feelings started? So I know that there's a, there's a lot of talk about, you know, it was born with Trump. This seems to be the media's line that President Trump is not a symptom of the era of bad feelings. He's the initiator of the, the era of bad feelings. From, a, you know, from my point of view, this obviously was present going all the way back to George W. Bush and Bush Hitler and the, and the war in Iraq. Um, but you know, there, there are other folks who have argued that this really the seeds of it were, were driven by the fall of the Soviet Union, that in the absence of some sort of existential threat from abroad, that Americans were bound to turn our guns on each other, politically speaking, and polarize along those lines. Where do you think this started and why has it gotten so bad? Started in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> uh, no, the, um, no, I do think that there is an element of truth that, um, that there, was, there were pre-existing tendencies and trends that Trump then accelerated. Um, and Partly, it's just the the polarization of American politics has to do with the realignment of the Republican Party into being an ideologically conservative party um, in a way that it wasn't. Uh, and that led to the Democratic Party becoming a more ideologically liberal party. And over time, this process fed on itself where you know, the Democratic Party becomes more liberal than um, uh, conservatives leave it. And they are not there anymore to restrain the Democrats. And there are no longer as many conservative Democrats in the House to restrain, um, you know, Speaker Pelosi uh, as there used to be. And this, the same thing happened on the Republican side. I do think one other big factor in this was the nationalization of the social issues. Um, once, uh, and I think the, the key event there is Roe v. Wade, where you have one side of this incredibly contentious issue winning through judicial fiat and then every you know, that becoming a sort of dominant issue in national politics um, in a way that it, it didn't have to be. You could have had a system where, you know, you could be a pro-choice Republican in California or a pro-life Democrat in Alabama and have a thriving national career. That used to be true. But as our politics became nationalized around that issue, it became less and less possible for it to happen. I mean, I, I think that, that, that that's a great point about the nationalization of the issues. And it does feel like you know, when we talk about the anti-left sentiment inside the conservative movement, if you have to put your finger on it, it does feel like that is driven almost entirely by, by culture and social issues. It feels like that the, all, all the talk about the dispossessed workers in the Midwest who had suddenly turned to Trump. When I talk to folks in the Midwest, their votes seem to be less driven by Trump is going to redo the trade deals with China and Mexico and much more to do with the, the coast hate us and want to destroy mm -hmm. our churches and they want to wreck our communities and they look down our nose at us and think we're bitter clingers that there's something a lot more passionate about support for Trump than merely they sort of like his economic program. If they like tariffs, they could have had Bernie Sanders, too, who's also pledged tariffs. Well, I mean, if you think about it, in 2008, Obama, you know, in addition to pretending to be against same-sex marriage, he's, <laughs> he's courting Rick Warren. Um, he's making sort of moderate noises on abortion. But I think between 2012 and 2016 in particular, Democrats really bought this idea that they're a coalition of the ascendant. All of their demographic groups are, are expanding. The Republican groups are declining. We don't need to pay attention to white working class voters anymore. And the thing is, people get the message that you are writing them off. The exit poll thing that I always harp on that, that nobody else has noticed, if you look at Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan, um, look at uh, white working class voters, white Catholic voters, white evangelical voters, these overlapping constituencies. Obama gets trounced by Romney in each of those groups in each of those states in 2012. But Hillary Clinton just got absolutely crushed. And the difference was enough to swing all three of those states. That is, that if, if she had just held her losses to where they were in 2012, you know, there would have been enough votes that you would have had, a, you know, more than 77,000 votes necessary to win all three of those states in the Electoral College. I mean, th this is one of the, the points that I think the media seem to keep missing when they talk about racism driving the Republican Party. There, there is racism in the Republican Party. There's intersectional racism in the Democratic Party, too. But the, the idea that because white voters started to think of themselves more as a voting bloc, that that is a, a, a response, a racist 
response to President Obama in particular, it seems to me ahistorical because it seems like the, the Democratic Party and the media spent years suggesting that this coalition of the ascendant was going to leave behind white working class voters. They're no longer relevant to our politics. And people in response said, well, I'm not going to vote for you. I'm going to vote for, for the other party. At least those people are you not looking down me, their nose. I don't want you. Yeah, exactly. And it, it seems like a, a reactionary response to the left, not merely we don't like Barack Obama because he's black. And if you look at the social science on um, racial conservatism being uh, associated with the vote and being a good predictor of the vote in 2016. Racial conservatism is a term of, term of art, and if you look at it, it's basically just conservatism applied to race. And these racially conservative attitudes like um, the idea that uh, that people have a lot of agency and can better their own lot and not everything is the fault of discrimination— that is a view that is shared by a lot of Hispanics and a lot of blacks. And it's it's really sort of white progressives who are most vociferous in the rejection of those views. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. I, mean, I look at these studies and, and they start characterizing views like people are responsible for their actions as racist. And I'm just thinking to myself, how is that even remotely racist? I mean, that, that is just a normal run-of-the-mill conservative view and, and more than conservative view from many mainstream Americans who are not conservative feel that way. And that, that sort of polarization is getting worse. Now, let's talk about the Democratic Party because it's pretty clear that I, I want to get back to the Republican Party and where you think that the the fragmenting tensions are, where you think the future of the Republican Party is. I want to get back to that. But the Democratic Party, I think that politically, the Democrats have been the driver of, of our politics since at least 2008. And that Barack Obama's election was a realigning election in a lot of ways. That Barack Obama, who campaigned in 2008, was not the Barack Obama who governed for, for his presidency. The kind of hopey and changey and we're united, not divided, and no red states, no blue states. Obama never showed up in the Oval Office. He campaigned, and then he just went on vacation for eight years. And instead, Barack Obama decided to build the the coalition that you talk about. And that, that alienated a lot of people. And that's led to a Democratic Party so radical that they can't even invoke President Obama in, in positive fashion anymore. They're too woke for Obama at this point, which has left Joe Biden in the lurch as the only person standing there going, hey, remember me? It was OK when when Obama was president. What's your take on, on the direction of the Democratic Party? So I think one oddity of the Democratic Party, I think it's been moving left really since the Clinton administration and both victory and defeat since the Clinton administration has been radicalizing for the Democrats. So when they win, it encourages kind of complacency about their leftism that, you know, they, they believe that history is on their side. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're the coalition of the ascendant. They own the future. And then when they lose, it just causes them to radicalize out of bitterness and rage. Um, and, you know, usually when they lose, it means they lose their more, most moderate members um, in their House and their Senate caucuses. Uh, and the problem with the kind of pr so they're they're always prone to this thinking that they've got the future locked because they're progressives and that's sort of this idea that history has a direction is just built into their worldview and the problem they have is prematurity so just as there's no reward in the stock market for being right prematurely um, appealing to the hypothetical voters of the future is not a substitute for getting the actual votes of people today. And you, I think it's pretty clear that that was a mistake they made in 2016. But what's amazing to me is that they often seem like they want to recapitulate that mistake. And really, it's just, it's so similar to what they did in 2016. What did they do in 2016, right? They assume that Trump is unacceptable to the electorate and therefore... They, they may ask Republicans for their votes. They may say, hey, you can vote for me, but they won't make any kind of programmatic compromise. They won't do safe, legal, and rare the way they used to do on abortion. They won't say, hey, you know, of course, we are not going to confiscate guns. Even the ones who aren't actually for confiscation, in general, they're not going out of their way to say that they're not for confiscation in the way that previous Democrats are, or excuse me, previous Democrats, Democrats were. Um, and so it seems to me the exact same bet in a lot of ways that they made in 2016. Well, maybe it'll work out this time. Uh, or maybe Biden, who's a little bit less in sync with uh, that way of thinking, will get the nomination and run a different kind of campaign. Um, but it does seem to me to be um, an awfully risky choice the Democrats are making. It seems to me politically that both parties are stuck in this weird model where they think that Barack Obama was the new normal when Barack Obama was actually the electoral outlier. What I mean by that is the Democrats seem to think that Barack Obama completely reshifted the nature of American politics so far that the coalition that he built is durable and, and rewinnable for every Democrat. It's not unique to Obama. You can run an old white woman. 
and she's going to win exactly the same coalition and even more voters, and it'll be just fine. And on the right, I think that there was a response to Obama that said, okay, his coalition is durable. We need something new and something shocking to break mm -hmm. up this coalition. And the truth is that in 2016, both Hillary and Trump performed kind of like generic Democrat and generic Republican. In other words, Barack Obama was the guy who had broken the dam because he was Barack Obama, an innately talented politician who also had a, a great level of skill and, and an enormous amount of positive media coverage. Um, but Hillary Clinton is not that. And in the absence of Barack Obama, the, the assumptions of durability of that coalition among Democrats is exaggerated. Or, or do you think that maybe they have a point that as time goes on, that coalition actually is ascendant over time? Well, I would say that if you look at, uh, and I, we've sort of talked about this online, um, if you look at trends among young voters, there is reason for Republicans and conservatives to worry um, as, as the country particularly gets browner and blacker um, and less white and possibly less religious. There's some grave reasons for concern. But these demographic changes, they happen slowly. It is still the case that there are persuadable voters out there who, you know, are going to go maybe this way or that way, depending on the choices that are put in front of them. A lot of people saw what the change in the elections of 2004 and 2008 and just vastly overread them. And demographic change just doesn't happen that rapidly. Now, I do think that there are some Republicans who spent, you know, so the Republican strategist class spent all the Obama years saying we all have to move way left on immigration and all these other things because of these demographic changes, and they were overreacting. But I think that there's kind of this implicit sense now among Republicans, well, all that was garbage, and we don't need to do anything. And, you know, in the long run, the demographics are real, and they do have to be accounted for. So in a second, I want to ask you a little bit more about the demographics, and uh, I want to have you expand on the on the browner and blacker comments just for media matters, because we know, of course, that they will come after anybody who mentions demographic change. And we'll talk about that in just one second. First, I don't go to the post office anymore. That's not because I don't like the services of the post office. The post office is great. But if I go there, I have to schlep all my stuff in my car. I have to get in the car. I have to go there. I make it a parking ticket. Last time I was at the post office, I did get a parking ticket. From now on, I'm using stamps.com. And you need stamps.com too. It's one of the most popular time-saving tools for small businesses. Stamps.com eliminates trips to the post office and saves you money with discounts you can't even get at the post office. Stamps.com will bring you all the amazing services of the U.S. Postal Office direct to your computer. Whether you're a small office sending invoices or an online seller shipping out products, even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. Simply use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send it. Once your mail is ready, just hand it to your mail carrier or drop it in a mailbox. It's that simple. With Stamps.com, you get five cents off every first class stamp up to 40% off priority mail. Stamps.com is a no-brainer. It saves you time. It saves you money. It's no wonder over 700,000 small businesses already use Stamps.com. They really do make life easier, which is why we use them here at Daily Wire. Right now, my listeners get a special offer. It includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Shapiro. That's Stamps.com. Enter Shapiro. Okay, so let's talk about that line that you talked about, the, the country getting browner and blacker, that being a problem for Republicans. So the left will say, of course, that's a problem for Republicans because they're racist. And, and that's the reason why President Trump is trying to restrict immigration is not because he cares about the culture of the country. It's because he cares about the race of the country. So I just want to have you clarify what exactly you mean by that so that folks don't immediately accuse you of being a white supremacist who wants a white country as, as a white man. That, that, like right. Yes. Yeah, I, right. I'm, a, I'm a as an Orthodox Jewish famous, man talking to a, a white, white supremacist. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that there is a case for uh, immigration policy changes. Um, my own thought on that is mostly that immigration has been a very successful experience for our country and to help it continue to be a successful experience for our country, we need to have an immigration policy that is conducive to immigrants assimilating to our country. And that doesn't mean that there are no cultural differences, that no you can't keep um, some of the traits and some of the traditions and heritage of the place you came from. But what I mean is m mostly that immigrants see themselves and are seen by others as being full participants in American life. Um, it seems to me that we're, that's probably going to be more successful when you've got a diverse flow of immigrants, when you've got a controlled flow, um, and when it's uh, a relatively highly skilled flow uh, of immigrants. Whether those are the exact same thoughts that motivate President Trump, I, uh, I, I'm not going to speculate. But then there's also this political question, which regardless of what our immigration policy is, it just seems to me that the demographic core of the Republican Party 
continues to be married white Christians. Um, that was the demographic core of the country, uh, but it is a shrinking share of the population. And um, whatever immigration policy we have, it seems to me the Republicans have to break out of that box and and expand their appeal to other kinds of voters. Or, you know, it would also be nice if more people got married, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> um, but I think there are different problems that Republicans have with these with different racial minorities. Uh, but a lot of it is uh, uh, related to not going out and asking for the vote, um, not being a continuing presence um, in different communities. And of course, there is also, you know, if if a Republican anywhere, you know, a state legislator you have never heard of says something boneheaded or offensive about a racial group, that person is guaranteed national stardom. I, I want to ask what you think we can do with regard to as conservatives to reach out to minority voters. So you talk about putting people in communities to to talk about these politics, not taking voters for granted. You know, th this is one area where, as I stated up front, I'm very concerned about President Trump's administration because Trump himself is so apt to say just the wrong kind of thing that I, I think it's very likely that he has alienated a, a huge number of people in growing minority groups. And, and I include among that you know, single women, and, and married women in the suburbs. There, there are a number of different groups that he seems to be alienating almost systematically uh, in, in a fashion that, that won't be good for him electorally and won't be good for the Republican Party long term. You know, I, I li I've lived my entire life in California. I look at the, the voting constituency of, of Hispanics and Latinos in California, and they vote 80-20 you know, Democrat, maybe, maybe higher than that. And then you go to Texas, and it looks a lot more like 55-45 Democrat. And that is because of the different, different attitudes, I would, th I would think, of the California Republican Party toward immigration and toward Hispanics generally, as opposed to the Texas attitude toward immigration and toward Hispanics mm -hmm. generally. And I wonder if the Republican Party is moving too much in the direction of California and less in the direction of Texas. Well, I, I'm not a fan of the way President Trump talks about racial issues in general. He has, however, um, speaking of somebody who's often criticized him on this front, uh, he has made some efforts to try to appeal to Hispanic voters and to African-American voters. And I think there is an element of the change that Trump has wrought in the Republican Party that could be useful um, here. Because one of the reasons why Republicans have not tended to do well among African-Americans and Hispanics, and fr frankly among young people, is that Republicans and conservatives have been seen as people who are most interested, almost exclusively interested, in the economic interests of big business and rich people. And that hurts, I think, Republicans across the board, but it's particularly going to hurt you with demographic groups that are having a harder time uh, getting jobs, having a harder time affording health insurance and so forth. And that is true of African Americans. It's true of Hispanics. It's true of young people, single people. Let's talk about that for a second. So you've written about reform conservatism right. in the past, the idea that conservatism ought to embrace more government involvement in a lot of economic areas. I tend to be a lot more libertarian and, and less comfortable with those sorts of conversations simply because the slippery slope is so incredibly slippery as far as government involvement in these particular issues. So where do you think that the government should be involved right. in issues like, for example, health care uh, or in the job market or in dealing with big business? So I don't think of reform conservatism as being about we need more government. I think it's about we need to apply conservative insights to the problems of today as opposed to the problems of 1981. So uh, what I want on health care is a radically reduced federal role where there's much less regulation and where federal spending, uh, federal tax and federal regulation does a lot less to channel where money is going in this sector. And I'd say the same thing about higher education as well. What I think what has been a problem is that there has been a tendency on the part of conservatives, because the Reagan su formula was so successful, to just stick with it and think, well, let's just keep cutting marginal tax rates and act as though they're still 70 percent the way they were in 1981. Um, now, do I believe that we should just radically privatize health care and get rid of Medicare and Medicaid? Uh, well, you know, let's get a couple more realistic items on the agenda uh, done, and then we can we can talk about that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I were starting from scratch, I would create these programs in the first place or Social Security, but they are here, and I think there's a lot that conservatives could do usefully to change these things and make them uh, more uh, more uh, conducive to success in a country that is mostly decentralized, mostly about trial and error 
and markets. These are systems like Medicare and Medicaid, higher education. They were not created by conservatives in general. And we can't, I think, adopt the posture that either we've got to blow them all up or we just kind of uh, go look at something else, right? We just do taxes all the time. Um, and that, I think, is the mindset that uh, that reform conservatives had to sort of overthrow. What do you think the conservative movement should do about big business? So there, there is this, this open debate over whether big business is something that conservatives should be for or against. It's always appeared to me that using big business as a separate class is a right. very bizarre sort of distinction because what makes a business worse or better doesn't depend on the size of the business. It depends on the sort of activities it's undertaking and its relationship with the government. But there is this, this attitude that has become very popular on the left with folks like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, and then on the right with Tucker Carlson, that big business is inherently bad business, and thus the government should step in to break up companies. The, the one we hear most about these days is Facebook. We heard a lot about the big tech companies. What's your take on the role of government in, in dealing with a lot of these big tech companies? Well, so a big business in general, I would say that we've got a, a large range of government subsidies for big businesses that I think that we should get rid of or at least scale back um, because I'm pro-market before I'm pro-business and pro-big business. I don't think that Americans are looking for the candidate. I think this is a great populist mistake. They're not looking for the person who will be the scourge of big business or the scourge of Wall Street, uh, and they shouldn't be. I do think that they want somebody who understands that most people have different interests than big business and Wall Street, and you know that they're looking out for them. And sometimes it'll, there'll be things that public policymakers can do that help big business and Wall Street and the average Joe. And sometimes there are places where you have to make a choice, and they want to come out ahead in that choice. I just think the public is, is a lot more sensible sometimes than we give them credit for. Um, on the specific questions about big tech, uh, I think there's just, it's, it's a complicated issue, frankly. There are a range of questions that people bring up. So there's the privacy question, for example, with respect to Facebook and so forth. And I tend to think, frankly, that it's overrated. I think people talk a good game about privacy, but they don't actually, through their revealed preferences, show that they care much about privacy at all. So Facebook, for example, if you were, if, if Facebook offered a sort of privacy protective package where you could be, a, you could be a part of Facebook and it would be 10 bucks a month, um, there'd be, I think, essentially zero uptake to that. And in fact, to make it clear market-wise, it would probably have to be more like $500. <laughs> um, but I think that there are some important questions uh, about what it's doing to our social landscape, what it's doing to our kids. Some of that, a lot of that, 80% of that has to be addressed by parents. Um, but there's also questions of, of policy. And, you know, one thing that I think we should look at is the way our schools have incorporated technology. Uh, I think that a lot of that, there's been a kind of technophilia that is kind of crazy. I'm not saying we should have, they should all be using an abacus. Um, but so, so I guess what I'm saying is we need to think through specific problems and solutions to them rather than um, sort of having a sort of a generalized attitude toward the tech companies and basing everything on that. So we've talked about a couple of areas of that Reagan stool that we talked about earlier. We've talked about the social conservative side. I want to talk a little bit more about that now. So the pro-life movement obviously has become extraordinarily powerful inside the right side of the aisle, inside the conservative movement. I'm very happy about that. Uh, I, I do wonder whether the tactics that are being pursued by state Republican parties are are beneficial to the long-term goals of the pro-life movement. So, for example, the state of Georgia passing heartbeat bills, uh, the, the attempt to pass protection from conception bills before the Supreme Court has even weighed in on incremental changes to Roe v. Wade. It seems like this might be tempting fate, that this is actually uh, maybe throwing good policy in the teeth of a Supreme Court that is likely to strike it down. What do you think is the best tactic for conservatives to use in fighting that pro-life battle? Well, I think that over the last 20 years or so, uh, 20 to 30 years really, we have seen three things simultaneously. We have seen states passing restrictions on abortion. We have seen um, people being more willing to identify themselves as pro-life rather than pro-choice. And, um, and we have seen a reduction in the number and rate of abortions. It seems to me that that's not a coincidence, that these three things have worked in tandem. So the incrementalist strategy uh, which really starts with the campaign in the mid-90s against partial birth abortion, I think has been successful. Now, I completely sympathize 
with my fellow pro-lifers who are impatient and who say, you know, this, the, the numbers are not going down as fast and as far as we should want them to. That, that's absolutely right. But I do think we have to be careful. And what we owe uh, unborn children is not um, uh, just statements of support, but practical and effective action that will achieve our goals of getting laws that recognize their humanity and their right to life and getting practices that welcome them into life. I am concerned that some of these laws that are being passed in different states like Georgia uh, make it harder for us to win our cases at the Supreme Court and may also make it harder for us to get politically sustainable protection for unborn children. At the same time, though, we've got a left that is going so far uh, to the extreme on their own. I think we'd be better positioned to capitalize on that if we were a little... if. If we sort of gestured, let's say, toward the public's ambivalence about abortion without necessarily totally embracing that ambivalence, if our public stance was something, look, we want every child protected in in law and in life, but in the meantime, can we at least agree on the third trimester and try to bring some of those soft pro-choice folks over to our side? And then once we've got that social consensus, once we've built and codified that, then we can say, okay, how about a week before the third trimester. Is there anything really that's so different about unborn children at this stage of development that they don't deserve protection? And sort of working to persuade people in a way that's, you know, sort of pers- part of what's going on here, Ben, is that the Supreme Court made it seem like persuasion wasn't necessary, that you could just accomplish what you need to by fiat. And part of what Georgia and Alabama and all these other states are doing, it's not serious legislating in the sense that they don't think this law is going to take effect. It's a statement to the Supreme Court. It's a, it's a, it's a throwing down of the gauntlet. Um, and I suspect if we were to move to actual legislation, we might see uh, the potential to build a consensus for life. So we've talked about a couple of the legs. The third leg of the stool in the Reagan stool is the hawkish foreign policy. And here we've seen a lot of, of firefighting inside the Republican Party of late. John Bolton being ousted from the Trump administration, Rand Paul and Liz Cheney going at it over American foreign policy. What do you think, if, is, is there any consensus mm-hmm. among Republicans or conservatives on foreign policy? It seems to me like this may be the weakest leg of the Republican stool at this point, mainly because it's not top priority until it's top priority foreign That's policy. That's exactly right. It's, it's never the thing that anybody cares about until we get attacked, God forbid, or until a war breaks out. But with that said, there was a general consensus after 9-11 that the United States needed to take a muscular role in the world to prevent the bad guys from coming here. And that consensus seems to be breaking down, contributed to in large part by President Trump, who I'm old enough to remember when Republicans spent eight years defending George W. Bush from accusations that he was a war criminal. (laughs) And then Donald Trump ran on the platform that George W. Bush was a war criminal in 2016, won the nomination, and then won the presidency. So do you think that there is any sort of consensus inside the Republican Party on, on the foreign policy front at this point? Well, you know, the debate between Elizabeth Cheney and Rand Paul, I think, is a depressing illustration of the point we were talking about earlier, where everything ends up being about Trump. So they're talking about these most important questions of what the federal government should do. What should our role in the world be? War, peace. And it's become who likes President Trump better, right? That's what it's just a total, performative. I mean, this, yeah. is all, this is all King Lear. Right. Every, everything with President Trump is King Lear. Like, who, who, can Cordelia yeah. right. finally appeal to him and earn a share of the kingdom? But like a junior high version. <laughs> <laughs> like, who's his best friend? You know, I was just with him last week. But um, so sometimes you're talking to people who are really interested in foreign policy and they'll ask you know, during the QA, when are American voters going to make this a top issue? It's like, you don't want the American voters to make foreign policy top issue because it's a sign that something's gone really badly wrong if that happens. What Americans expect the people in charge of the government to be taking care of that set of issues and they'll, they don't want to think about it all that much themselves. They don't know, frankly, a lot of stuff about what's going on in different international hotspots. But if something flares up, they'll get they'll be upset that these things were not taken care of. I myself tend towards a kind of pragmatism in foreign policy where I think our foreign policy has to be hard-headed based on the pursuit of American national interests. Um, and that means it can't be isolationist. We can't pretend as though we are, you know, 1875 America. Uh, but at the same time, we can't be uh, the leaders of a global crusade for liberal democracy because our resources are limited and we are not omnipotent. Um, 
that there is a huge space in between those visions, but it does seem as though the debate is largely conducted between those visions. Um, but the other thing I would say is regardless of sort of where you draw the line, where we should be, you do want a foreign policy that is steady, that is competently executed, um, that our, our, our allies and enemies both have a general sense of, uh, of where we're coming from. And, uh, and I would give low marks to this administration on that question. So now I want to ask you to do what our friend Jonah Goldberg would call rank punditry. So I want, I want you to evaluate the Democratic field going into the primaries for next year. Now, if you were to do an overall assessment of the Democratic field, where are the strengths among these candidates in the primaries? And where do you see the, the possibility of victory over President Trump in general? So... Uh my rank pundit card may have been revoked in 2016 when I... It, for all of us, for yeah. all of us. I lost too much money in 2016 right. to ever do it again. Um, it seems to me that sort of um, the theory of Biden makes more sense than the actual Biden. But uh, somebody who is not for um, kicking uh, everybody in employer-based health insurance or Medicare Advantage off of the plans that they have and in general like... Um, you know, who doesn't believe that uh, deportation is always a dirty word uh, when it comes to illegal immigrants. Um, but, you know, you have there are real questions about whether he's up to it, whether he's up to the presidency, whether he's up to being the nominee. And even the Democrats who say, well, OK, so sometimes he says dumb things, but he's up against Trump. Yeah, but you're you are losing the opportunity to capitalize on a potential strength against Trump if you run him. I've been in the buy uh, camp with Biden. I still think that's true. Uh, and it's partly because, let's turn to I, who I think is his number one rival for the Democrats at this point, and that's Elizabeth Warren. And um, partly with Elizabeth Warren, I think she is a classic. You know, so the, the old theory of the Democratic nomination process was there's a beer track and a wine track. And, uh, and the beer track voters are people who are much more sort of um, kind of like the old, uh, the old hard hat Democrats mm. and very practical minded, um, often socially conservative or socially moderate, the kind of people who, uh, who propelled Mondale's win over Gary Hart, who was a wine track candidate or Gore's over Bill Bradley. And the, the big, and normally the beer track candidate wins the Democratic nomination. The great difference was 2008 when African Americans were typically with the beer track candidate sided with Obama, and you had a coalition of affluent, socially liberal whites and African Americans, and that's the majority in the Democratic primary. Warren right now has part of that coalition. She's got the affluent, socially liberal whites. She doesn't yet have any demonstrated appeal to African American voters. I have a hard time seeing how she wins the nomination without making some inroads there. So I, I just think her demographic base is too narrow. Then there's Bernie Sanders. Uh, I think Sanders misunderstood the 2016 race, and a lot of Sanders supporters misunderstood the 2016 race. They thought that people were supporting him because he's a socialist. And in fact, um, he, was, he did more to help socialism than socialism did to help him. Uh, and being a socialist meant that he was crazy enough to challenge Hillary Clinton when everybody else with any ambition in the party was, was swept off the field. But there was an anti-Clinton market. There were people who didn't like her, people who thought she was cynical and corrupt. Who knows where they got that idea? And they liked him because he was idealistic. But when he's not up against Hillary Clinton and when there are several people in the race, his market turns out to be much smaller than that. And I think he's sinking and I think he's going to continue to sink as a result. Finally, there are the sort of the moderate non-Biden folks, sort of the, the Klobuchars, maybe the Bookers, based on his past, if not where he is right now. And I think that we've reached a stage in the primary, you know, all of those guys, Buttigieg, another one, they're all assuming that if Biden collapses, they'll be there to inherit it. I don't think that's the way it's going to work. I think if Biden collapses, Democratic elites will say, well, I guess there is no audience for moderation and, you know, it's, it's full speed ahead. Um, and it'll it'll work to the advantage of one of the other candidates. So let's talk for a second about the rise of the woke white progressives. There have been a bunch of studies that have come out recently that show that the most liberal folks in the party, the most leftist folks in the party, are no longer members of racial minorities. That's not actually what's driving a lot of the feeling on, on sort of the woke side, the Howard Zinnification of the Democratic Party. Instead, it's a bunch of people who went to prep schools and colleges on, on the coasts and they are way to the left of the general population. 
what happened to the Democratic Party that the woke, the woke white left took it over? Because it used to be that the most left-leaning area of the Democratic Party in a lot of ways was, was not that particular demographic. Now it's college-educated whites who are leading the, the charge directly off that left-wing cliff. So I think it's a, a lot of things that fed into this. One is polarization and the old conservative Democrats having left the party and old liberal Republicans joining the Democratic Party. Um, it's partly thinking that you know, history's on their side um, and uh, misunderstandings of what happened in 2016. So um, if it's the Russians' fault... Uh, or if it's just Hillary didn't go to Wisconsin or Hillary was a personally off-putting candidate even, then you don't need to make any compromises on your positions. There's nothing wrong with your ultimate program. Um, so you've got all of those things going for you. Then there's this sort of the emotional reaction to Trump. So, so you become sort of more hostile to any position that is associated with Trump and associated with the Republican Party. And then finally, I do believe that social media has played a role here, that, um, that people are in the echo chamber of, of Twitter where the woke white left looms larger and that affects how they think about where the party is, where um, that it, it changes the way journalists think um, where the center of the Democratic Party is, for example. And it's wildly unrepresentative of most voters. It's not just a question of views being different. It's also a question of the things that are on people's minds being different. If you are a Twitter obsessive, as I, I'll confess, sometimes I am, um, compared to normal people. And, uh, you know, we get a misleading picture of Democrats. We think that, you know, sort of the, your typical Democratic voter is obsessed with what pronouns people use. And this is not true. Yeah, and I think that really is the, the social media bubble that you're talking about. I think that it's it may have started with the sort of get out white vote, meaning the, the, the movie Get Out has, mm -hmm. features this, this white couple who is obviously disdained, but they spend their time talking to the black main character about how they voted for Barack Obama, and this has alleviated them of all of their white guilt over everything. It's the, the group of folks who are taking pictures of themselves in the ballot box while they, or in the voting booth right. while they were voting for Barack Obama. And now social media has, has generated an entire cottage industry of all of this. Aziz Ansari has a comedy special in which he talks about the woke white liberals who are sitting there doing their virtue signaling points, talking about how they loved crazy rich Asians, even if they only kind of liked crazy rich Asians, to demonstrate to everybody yeah. else how, how woke they are. And it, it seems unsustainable because that side of the party is still a minority of the Democratic Party. I mean, by polling data, the Joe Biden wing of the party is still larger than the white woke liberal strain of the Democratic Party. I wonder if at any point there are enough members of the Democratic Party to just shout stop like this, mm -hmm. is, this is going too far. Well, you know, there's a history for that. So if you think back to 1992 or the late 80s and early 90s when you have Bill Clinton trying to change the Democratic Party, think about his three great uh, heresies in the 92 campaign for the left. It was um, welfare reform, uh, the death penalty. And uh, and if you remember Sister Soldier, you may have been too young for that, but, you know, black this people moment, shouldn't yeah. actually kill white people. Um, that was, um, those were all views that were actually comp widely shared among Democratic voters, but offended a thin slice of Democratic activists and opinion leaders. And and Clinton was able to to make a huge change in the party by leveraging that fact. He got the country at large to change its opinion of Democrats, at least for a while. Uh, and it was acceptable to Democrats at large because this group of people were not actually representative of them. So maybe that happens again, but of course that required three losses in presidential elections in a row before Democrats were willing to, to take that medicine and, and the elites were willing to say maybe some of the things we've been doing need to change. It also feels like the, the level of interconnection has made this so much more difficult because before, if you had nuts who were kind of screaming at you, you just said, okay, there are a few nuts who are screaming at me. Now you have crazy people screaming at you and entire corporations bow before them. And Kevin Williamson in his new book talks specifically about the activation of the corporation as a tool yeah. of the left in the sense that corporations are created to create the company man. They create the company man that sort of the widgets who work for them and they have to have corporate positions on everything and they are there to, to avoid risk. And the greatest risk for a lot of companies right now is being in the headlines at all. So if you see 12 tweets about something, then you better issue an apology and move to the left and, and, and signal about how much you, you love particular aspects 
of the social left program simply to avoid all of the blowback. So I wonder in the area of social media if, if it's ever going to be possible to walk this stuff back because the loudest people tend to have outsized impact on social media and because companies don't seem to have the willingness in the corporate world to actually just say no to all of this nonsense. I mean, do you see that there's going to be any sort of corporate blowback coming or is the entire market going to fragment right now? Because on putting aside government, it seems like on a social level, what we are now aiming toward is completely different spheres in which we all operate. Like conservatives won't be able to go to Walmart anymore. They'll go to conservative Walmart and liberals will only be able to go to I remember when Walmart was considered a Walmart. Hey, exactly, right? I mean, well, I think it is still the case. I think it has long been the case and is still the case that conservatives are more sort of quietistic about um, a lot of these things and are more likely to compartmentalize politics from other things. So, yeah, they're, you know, when uh, uh, Nike threw Betsy Ross under the bus, um, there were definitely conservatives that, well, I'm not buying Nike anymore. But I think it is still the case that your average conservative is more likely to say, well, it's a good shoe. I'm going to buy it. Um, now, that may change. That may be changing now. Um, but until at least recently, I think you'd have to say that it made sense for companies to be more responsive to the left than to the right based on this behavioral difference between conservatives and liberals. Okay, so President Trump has extraordinarily high approval ratings among Republicans, not among Americans generally, but among Republicans. And you've talked about polarization. You've talked about the fact that the left is polarized and that the right is polarized. Is the... It, is it wise for the Democratic Party to continue to fight these culture wars? They, they continue to believe that they are winning the culture wars, but it seems like for every culture war they win, they lose a political war because conservatives don't know how to fight culture wars. So instead, they fight culture wars by electing culture warriors to positions of political prominence. Well, it depends on your priorities. I mean, if you are a liberal activist who's mainly interested in those culture wars, uh, then yeah, go on fighting them. And, you know, you have made gains and you may continue to make gains. If you're most concerned about, um, you know, getting more, getting a higher minimum wage or getting more government provided health care or something, maybe that doesn't make sense as your priority, because I do think that it gets in the way of building a larger democratic coalition. I mean, my free advice, since I don't think it'll be actually taken up to Democrats, if I were them, the message I would use against Trump in 2020, leaving aside what shape the economy is in, would be something like he's plutocratic. He's got, you know, he talks about being on the side of the workers and he's got all these Goldman Sachs people in his administration and all these lobbyists. And he, you know, he's, he's not actually interested in, uh, in the common guy. But that, I think, would require a level of discipline that they're not capable of attaining because what actually moves them is more, you know, what pronouns people use. And the other thing is, you know, so think about these Obama, Trump. Think about a Wisconsin. There are, there are counties in Wisconsin that voted for Bush twice and Obama twice and then Trump, that voted for uh, Scott Walker and then voted for Tammy Baldwin. These people are not locked in. They absolutely, a segment of them at least, could be courted back to the Democratic Party. But does it seem to you that the Democratic Party is more interested in courting those voters or in judging them? And trying to get tell them, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself for the way you voted last time. It seems to me there's an obvious answer to that question. And it seems to me that those voters know the, the answer to that question as well. And do you think that that attitude has extended to the intelligentsia inside the Democratic Party? So you li I live in L.A. You live in New York. I'm sure you've had many long conversations with folks on the left over the years. I get the feeling being. I actually in the, live in the DC area, so that's. Oh, okay, sorry. America, yeah, exactly. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, but um, when it comes to the the sort of punditocracy, it feels like it's it's more and more difficult to find people on the other side of the aisle who are even willing to have the conversation. In fact, the the willingness to have a conversation is seen as a sort of heresy yeah. among certain members of the the intelligentsia on the left. Has that been your experience? Oh, there's no question that uh, that that happens. Remember uh, Joel Kaplan getting uh, mau mau by some Facebook employees because he showed up w during the hearings for his friend, Brett Kavanaugh, when, and former colleague uh, for the Supreme Court. So, yeah, it's all people are people are not willing to concede that intelligent people of goodwill can be on the other side of them from an issue. Um, at least when they're not thinking about people they already know and like. So maybe they're willing to make that concession about a family member or about a friend, but it's very easy to think of a kind of faceless abstraction of conservatives or liberals, and they're all terrible people. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge problem. And frankly, even on the friend and family side, um, partly because of polarization, people have less 
of that in their own lives than they used to. Uh, do you think that's fixable? I mean, my, my, my belief is that the, the militating social institutions that used to at least allow yeah. us to get together and, and see each other face to face and not see just our political perspectives on Facebook have fallen away. And so the growth of social media, coincident with the destruction of the social fabric, have, have amounted to what may be an unbridgeable gap. Uh, w do you believe that this is restorable? So I, I think that the social issues and the nationalization of the social issues did a lot to unleash this dynamic. It has sort of floated free to some extent and, and taken on a life of its own. Um, but again, outside of Twitter, most people are not quite that revved up. And I do think, and maybe this is sort of utopian on my part, I do think that if you were to denationalize some of those issues, that maybe politics could move to a healthier place. But, uh, but at the moment, it's very hard to see it. At the moment, you can just see the way this dynamic just feeds on itself over and over. And so from a conservative perspective, we've talked about sort of how to defederalize these issues if you're, if you're on the left, mm -hmm. namely concede that abortion is not a national Supreme Court issue. But if you're on the right, how would you go about defederalizing a lot of these issues when it looks as though you're battling people who want to keep federalizing all of these issues. Well, it's in a way, it's sort of easier advice for us because we just have to win on <laughs> Roe uh, v. Wade. And we've never really, you know, so I suppose you could say there was an attempt in the uh, in the 2000s to have a federal uh, solution on same-sex marriage. Um, but certainly nobody on the conservative side of that issue still thinks that that is the thing to do. At most, and this is probably too far a reach, it's wanting to recreate federalism on that issue. And I do think that that has to be what we allow, because we're just not going to build a national consensus on each of these issues. How do we get back to an educational, an educational role for, for the intelligentsia and, and get back to education in sort of the basics? Because everybody has an opinion on abortion. Everybody has an opinion on same-sex marriage. Nobody seems to understand how checks and balances work, including the presidential candidates, who seem to spend each and every day promising that they are going to override every single check and balance in the Constitution mm -hmm. to do whatever it is that they want to do today. Beto O'Rourke promising that he's simply going to come to your house personally and take your guns, for example, or Elizabeth Warren suggesting she's going to personally rewrite the First Amendment. I is there a way to re-educate people about the importance of, of these institutions or have people basically given up on that? Because again, it's a lot easier to sound off on the issues than it is to understand that sometimes checks and balances mean you don't get what you want. So I think partly it has to be a way, uh, and I don't, I'm not going to be able to answer a follow-up question on this, <laughs> but we have to figure out a way to reward legislators for being legislators. So, so much of what um, folks and what ought to be the first branch of the federal government do is they use their position as a platform for self-expression. Frankly, President Trump does a lot of this too. I mean, he, he views himself sometimes as the internet commoner in chief rather than the president of the United States and in Donnie a traditional from Queens. way. Donnie yeah, from exactly. Queens calling in, yeah. Right. So what goes against the grain of our culture over the last 50 years is we need people who are more willing to take up the institutional role and maybe a little less eager to express themselves personally. And our culture is all about self-expression, right? It is not at all about self-control, and that gets worse year after year. So in a way, I mean, I've just I sort of maybe identified one of the preconditions for solving the problem, which is not quite the same thing as solving the problem. Maybe the answer to that is that the American people need to stop looking to politicians as their moral guides. It's always been very well, weird. Well, Trump is me. useful in that respect. I mean, I, I've actually said this to, yeah. my, to my friends on the left, is you guys keep bitching about Trump. And believe me, I didn't like Barack Obama very much. You know, I have a solution for this, is that the executive branch could just become less powerful, and then you wouldn't care who is the head of the executive branch. And I feel the same way about the federal government generally. We spend such an enormous amount of time trying to struggle with the ramifications of a powerful federal government. Well, if you don't like who's running it and I don't like who's running it, then how about we just minimize the power of this of this giant well, institution in the so, first place? So let me say something nice about the public. I do think that if, if a, say, let's say Biden were the nominee, if he were to run a campaign, one of whose most important implicit messages, at least, is, look, make me president and you won't hear from me every day. You know, there will not be drama constantly. I will not share with you my opinion about Don Lemon. Uh, I think that there would be a big audience for that, for people who, and frankly, I think that was part of George W. Bush's um, campaign message in 2000, which was, like, I'm not going to actually disrupt all this, the, the Clinton status quo, but I'll, you know, there'll be dignity. You, you won't be sort of averting your eyes from the Oval Office um, the way you had to under the under Bill Clinton. And uh, I think that that is something that people still would like. I totally agree with this. I mean, I, I have the the bizarre opinion that, that Joe Biden's apparent narcolepsy 
as well as his his shocking senility, may actually cut in favor of him in a general election because who's scared of that guy, right? I mean, like he's going to early bird dinner at Denny's. He, 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 we don't have to worry about that guy being a transformational yeah, right. president and rewriting the rules of the road or shocking us all out of our complacency. He's just going to be some guy, right? He's, he's he, just, he could bring back the fireside chat, you know? It's, uh, it's, it's completely plausible. I mean, he, he'd be distributing record players. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm totally into this. Like, as long as he's into the, the record player business and not in our face, like it, I'm not voting for Joe Biden, but the fact is that that is, that is an appealing idea that, that we are not in this fight every single day. Well, in one second, I want to ask Ramesh whether he actually is going to vote for Donald Trump. You know, the hardest question of all. Ramesh, of course, visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. If you want to hear Ramesh's final answer, you have to subscribe over at dailywire.com. Go there, click subscribe, make the magic happen for yourself. Ramesh Panur, thanks so much for stopping by. This has really been a joy. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. This was fun. Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special is directed by Mathis Glover and produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Associate producer, Colton Haas. Our guests are booked by Caitlin Maynard. Post-production is supervised by Alex Zingaro. Editing by Donovan Fowler. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. Title graphics by Cynthia Angulo. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019.